Hey everyone, whether you're joining us online or in person, we just want to say welcome. You're about to hear an incredible message from our senior pastor, Chad Braswell. But before that, if you're watching online, I want to encourage you to like, comment, and share this video so that others can join us as well. Here we are. There's no place like being in God's house. No place like being in God's house. Tell your neighbor you're glad they're here. <laughs> We've been excited to come home. Um, you know, everyone deserves a vacation. We had some work in Florida. I spoke at a church in Tampa that's doing really well. I love seeing God's house grow everywhere. What we're experiencing here isn't only happening here, and that's what's so exciting about God's body. The body of Christ is global, and it's moving forward, and Jesus is building his church, and the, gate, uh, church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Isn't that right? And so I'm thankful that you are here. I want to start a new series today. So let's pray and dive right into it. Father, we're so thankful for your presence. We're thankful for your word that's a lamp and a light unto our feet. Father, you show us the ways to go. You teach us who you are. And we're thankful that we hear your voice. We're thankful, Holy Spirit, that your presence is here and that you have the ability to help us change and rearrange the places in our hearts so that we can be more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. It is so good to be in God's house. You know, I, I think about it. I don't know about you, but I've got some fond memories of my childhood. I remember coming off of the school bus, so happy school was over, so happy. In fact, I remember that a lot, that I was happy school was over. But I remember coming off the school bus, just a little seven, eight-year-old kid, and I, was, I had snacks on my mind and TV on my mind. I was ready to go have some me time. At eight years old, I understood I needed me time. You know what I'm saying? And so I came off that bus, and I threw down my backpack when I got in the house, and I ran over, and I got me a Hot Pocket. I climbed up into that couch, and I turned on that TV just in time for some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Or depending on the day, maybe it was more like rescue rangers, but I was about to have some me time. And I remember as the plot thickened and as my hot pocket got less and less, and I just remember it was getting really good, you know, like pivotal time in this cartoon. And I'm, I'm like on the edge of my seat, is Monterey finally going to get that cheese? Monterey Jack, or, or what's going to happen? And then all of a sudden, eh, eh, eh. this is only a test. This is only a test. And it made me think, what am I missing? What is going on? I'm this, it's the first time I've ever experienced this. And I'm thinking, wait, wh what's happening right now? And this was before. It's not like the TV show paused. This test happened. And when the test ended, I don't know what happened to the cheese. And I'm going, what? is going on right now. I was so upset. I was like, what is this test? This is only a test. This is an emergency broadcast test. If this were real, if it's not real, stop it. <laughs> oh, still, so I, I still do not know what happened in that episode. And so I still am asking Julie, I should probably buy all the episodes to go back to fix this trauma that has happened in my childhood. <laughs> And you say, what on earth is he talking about right now? See, when I read scripture, there are many times that I actually am reading going, wait a minute, this is a test. God is literally giving this person a test and they don't realize in the moment they're in a test, but this is only a test. And how many know it's easier hindsight when we understand everything to look back and go, oh yeah, that was a test. In the middle of it, oftentimes we don't know it's a test. I'm here to help us start to identify things that we don't understand, that it's just a test. It's just a test. And someone's saying, certainly our God would never test us. What makes you think that? Certainly our God would never test us. Of course he would. Not because he's some mean old man on an anthill waiting to just torch us with a magnifying glass if we get it wrong, but because he wants to see where is our treasure? What is our faith? What is our level of expectation? Do we really believe him at, at his word? You know, I, I think about it and there's so many times we read in scripture where God shows that he's testing. And, and so as I begin this series of going through, this is only a test I just want to touch on a few things that, that might blow your mind. But do you realize God created the first test before he created mankind? 
God created the trees we weren't supposed to touch before he put man in the garden. So I need you to understand that God has created things that are meant to grow us. They're meant to stretch us. They're meant to lift us to a place that we would not go if it weren't for the test. Can you, can you get to a place where you understand test isn't always bad, but it is normally hard. Hard is not bad. Sometimes we say, oh, this is hard. I don't want it, but it doesn't mean it's bad for us. We just have to understand what it is and perceive it differently. And so when I think about the fact that the the tree of knowledge of good and evil was there, the tree of life was there before we were ever even in the garden, it helps me understand my God. Well, someone says, why on earth would he put trees that we can't touch? Well, because if we truly loved him, we wouldn't touch it. I'm just throwing that out there. God wants to know, do we trust him? Do we love him? Will we obey his commands? As as Pastor Marco was saying up here, if you love me, then you will. Well, how do we know? How does God know where we stand unless we do? Unless we do go through that process. And so it's just important. As I read many of the stories, I think about how God shows us uh, many different times where he's testing. I even see that Jesus, he gives us opportunities to show faith or not. It's a test. It's only a test. Today, as I begin the series, I want to start with a place in the Bible where Jesus encounters 10 lepers in a village between Samaria and Galilee. And as I read this, I thought, this is a test. So let's read it together. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. You have to understand, he's going into the village, and that's, he's meeting the lepers because the lepers aren't allowed to be in the village. They are standing far away from him because they're not allowed to be within the civilization, within the city, within the people, because they've got a disease that there's not wanting it to spread. So when you were told that you had leprosy, you were actually expelled from community for the sake of keeping the rest safe. And so these 10 lepers are hanging out together because they're the only people they can hang out with. And so they're they're seeing Jesus from a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he uh, saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, in our context, in our day, we can look at that and go, that's really cold. He just says, go show yourself to the priests. What we don't understand contextually is that's the thing they've always longed to be able to do. See, if you had leprosy, going to show yourself to the priests mean you are healed and you are wanting to be re-invited into society. You're, you're literally hoping one day to go before the priests and say, look, I'm cleansed, I'm healed. And then the priests, they would look you over, they would examine, they would then affirm that you are healed and you could go back home, you could get back into society. So as you read this, you might be like, wow, Jesus, that was heartless. No, it was exactly what they wanted to hear. It was the exact words they'd hoped to hear. And, and so, so it says this, when he, uh, it, it says that... Uh, And as they went, say as they went, as they went, went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. We'll get to that point later. It says this, Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Eh, eh, eh. This was a test. This was a test. Where were the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This this story, as I read through it, I thought, man, there's a test happening here, and they weren't aware of the test. Oftentimes, we're not aware of the testing that we're in. We're in the middle of, and it's important for us to understand that our God, he does create opportunities for our faith to shine. He creates opportunities for us to grow into a space we weren't in before. How many know that growth sometimes hurts a little bit? I remember shin splints. Growing isn't always comfortable, but the reality is you can never be anything bigger unless you're willing to go through some stuff. 
You're never going to have the perseverance unless you had to persevere through some stuff. You're never going to have patience unless you had an ability to have your patience tested. Are, are you understanding this? And, and so as, as I'm starting this series with you, this is only a test. Here's the first test. Number one, do you notice his presence? Do you notice his presence? I want to start this thing before he even gets into the village. It says, as he was going into the village, Jesus traveled along the border. And as he was going into a village, 10 men with leprosy met him. They noticed his presence from afar. They knew who he was before he entered the village. Here's a question for you. Would you know it if God showed up in this room right now? If the Holy Spirit moved, would you sense his presence? Would you know his presence was here? Or would you just be like, what are those weird people doing? I grew up in a Pentecostal move. This, this church, we've seen God move. We still see God move. But I've had some carpet time. I've never known how I hit the rug. And until you've been on the rug, you can't challenge or judge the people that are on the rug. Wow, they sound weird. What are they saying? Well, until you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you speak in an unknown tongue, you can't judge the one that's speaking in the unknown tongue because they're in a place you're not yet. This is a spirit-filled church. This is a full gospel church. We believe the scripture cover to cover. And so I'm trying to help you understand that God is calling us to places that we are uncomfortable with right now. But you have to understand, can you, exp do you, do you understand what his presence is in the room? You might be in the middle of worship, and all of a sudden, so you just feel like, wow, there was a shift in the atmosphere. What happened? We have songs where we say, uh, there's something changing in this room. Do you know when there's a change? Do you know when the presence of God is here, where you just don't want to move, and you just don't want it to end? Yes. Do you understand his presence? Are you noticing his presence? They knew his movements. They knew what he would look like. They, they knew when he was coming, what it would look like. How do we know when God moves? Because we read about his previous moves. We study church history. Through the scripture, we read about an amazing moves of God through our times in the past. We know what God looked like, but how many know God is always doing a new thing? You know, he's doing it. Who's doing it? God is doing a new thing. DC Talk, figure it out. It's awesome. Okay, listen, he's always doing a new thing. So it doesn't mean it's always going to look like it did before. But if it looked crazy before, it's probably still going to be a little crazy. Yeah. I'm just saying. Really but do I know his presence? It's a test. Do I understand when he's in the room? How can you receive from someone you don't even understand his presence? These people understood. They had planned. They had heard stories of this miracle worker. They knew the miracle man was coming. They knew what he was going to look like. Oh, he's always surrounded with about 12. Okay, so there's, they knew what he was going to sound like. They, before he even made it to him, they were calling out, which leads me to the next thing. Will you humble yourself and call out? Will you humble yourself and call out? It's a humbling thing to ask for help, isn't it? In fact, the people that need help normally have too much pride to ask for help. They don't receive help, and then they're, they're indignant toward the fact that they didn't get help. If they had just humbled themselves and actually asked for help, they would have received the help they need, but pride went before their own fall. Am I humble? Have I found the ability to humble myself and, myself and call out for the help that I need? It's humbling to ask. Look, it says, they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Say, Master. Master. It helps when you know who to call out to. Too many people, they call out to their peers who can't do anything about it. They just talk about their problems. Just talk about their problems. I think about the book of Job where Job's talking about his problems to all the wrong people and they're giving him all the wrong advice. Yeah. Yeah. That's most of the people that don't understand how to go to the master when they have a problem. Yeah. You know, when I say, do you know where, do you experience, do you know the presence of God? This is a test. The fact is you all have passed the test. You're in church on a Sunday morning where you know you can experience God. God willing, you're in a healthy church, which you are here. Thank Jesus for that. But listen, when you have the ability to be in the presence, so, so many people want to receive from God, but they're too busy to get up and go to church. They're too busy to actually raise their kids in the house of God. And then they plead 15 years later for the church to help them because they never raised them in the house of the Lord. And they're now just asking for somebody to help them, help them. And how many know we want to help them, but it would have been easier if we started from the beginning. 
God is a line upon line, precept upon precept. He's formulaic. He teaches us in a way that we can learn and understand and move forward in. Are you aware of his presence? Will you humble yourself and call out? It's a humbling thing to ask for help. It's even more humbling to call out for it and make yourself obvious. And it's even more humbling to say, have pity on me. Are you at a place where you realize you're a wretch? Are you at a place where you realize without God's intervention, you're screwed? Without God's intervention, hell is a certainty. Without God's intervention, without Jesus' grace, without the cross, without the empty grave, without God doing something, there is no hope. God, it makes me think about Jesus when he tells a parable. I don't have the scripture for you back there because this just came now. So first service didn't get it. You're getting it, okay? But listen, I think about Jesus when he's telling the parable about the man who walks in and prays to God, thanking God that he's not like that man. This Pharisee, this Sadducee, this person who's praying, thanking God in his pompous, arrogant ways. But then you have the one who understands they're a wretch. They won't even look to the heavens. They won't even raise their head to God. They just say, God, show mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, this is the one that will be forgiven. This is the one that will be blessed. There's something very powerful about understanding you're my master. Take pity on me. I humble myself. Without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I have no hope. Jesus, master, have pity on us. Do we understand our desperation and our need of Jesus? Or do we live in a Western society where we're so used to comfort, we just don't really know how to comprehend the fact that we are absolutely dead and gone without Jesus. We need a healthy dose of reality. You know, doors open and I travel quite a bit for the sake of what God's called me to do. And I see a lot of people with far less doing something that others would consider menial or others would consider this or that. And they are the happiest they've ever been. They have such a peace and such a joy and such a happiness of living the life that they're called to live. They're not playing rat race. They're not looking at what everyone else has. They're just saying, thank you, Jesus, that I know you. Thank you that I have a place. Thank you that I'm called. Thank you that I have a family. Thank you that I get to serve at your feet. Thank you that I get to serve at your feet. I was, I was talking with somebody yesterday, and we were talking about church life and growth and, and how Sometimes people are just trying to climb a ladder rather than just being thankful they're part of the army. Yeah. You know, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm in the UK and, and preaching, I don't have to explain the sovereignty of a king. They're at the king's pleasure. There's blessings to be raised in a monarchy, apparently, when it comes to understanding God. Sometimes we've got to get over the speed bumps and hurdles of our culture that do not jive with God's word. We think we deserve something. We're wretch. Have pity on us. Master, have pity on me. I'm thankful that I was raised in this country, but don't allow these cultural norms to keep me from absolute truth. Do you understand your desperation and a need for the master's attention? Number three, will you go when it doesn't show? Will you go when it doesn't show? It says in verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. They moved without seeing what they hoped for. They started moving without yet being cleansed. Go show it without it now. That's what Jesus was saying. Eh, eh, eh. This is only a test. Will you go when you don't feel it? Someone's being convicted on the other side of the screen because they didn't feel like going to church, but they really weren't sick. Now they're just trying to catch us online. I love you more when you're in person. <laughs> Why? Because then I can hug you. You're part of the community. See, if all you're doing is taking supplements online rather than being sharpened by the body and the community, you're missing out of what God has called family. When a problem happens, that keyboard and monitor aren't going to show up and pray for you. 
When you need to be married, you want to actually know your pastor and who you're calling on. I take it very serious being a pastor, and it's not an easy life. I promise you that. Most young people say, what do you think about me being a pastor? I say, run. <laughs> do the Jonah thing. See if you can avoid it. If you end up in a whale, then just do it. <laughs> but, but seriously, it's a different call. But what I will tell you is you're never going to get the freedom and the fullness that comes with church community on the other side of a screen. And I'm breaking all the rules because a lot of pastors say, don't do that. You, need, you just keep everybody you can, keep influence. No, I'm not just trying to have influence. I'm trying to get people to heaven. Yeah. But so, so you think about this. Will you go when it doesn't show? Think about those 10. They're, they're, Jesus, have mercy. Have pity on us, master. And Jesus says the words they want to hear, go and show yourself to the priests. And they're kind of like, And I don't know which one was the first that was like, <laughs> but I'm sure one bold one who was probably the leader started and others were like, <laughs> and then what's the conversation look like? What are we doing? It's not, it hasn't happened yet. He said, go, who's he? He, he said, go. Do you know who the he is and what he said? And are you willing to go when it doesn't show? At your word, we'll throw the nets on the other side, even though we've toiled and fished all day. At your word, we will go, we will do, even though we don't feel it, even though we don't see it, we'll do it. This is only a test. This is only a test. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but the miracle worker is working a miracle out. He'll never let his kids down. Number four, will you believe when you can't see? They're moving. They're beginning the process. They're walking. They're going to the place they'd hoped to go to say the words they've always wished to say, but they haven't yet seen it. That sounds like blind faith. Well, let's talk about that. Because it says in Luke 17, verse 14, as they went, they were what? As they went, they were cleansed. And I'm always blown away about this. I, I've preached many messages about um, uh, wherever I travel. I oftentimes like to preach one I call mud pies and miracles. And it talks about the, when Jesus spit into the mud and made mud pies and rubbed it in the eyes and then told him to go wash. And I always think about that kind of like, well, God, what was the purpose of that? We've seen you touch people and heal them. We've seen you just say the word and they come dancing out of a grave when they were dead before? What is it about the process? And then I realized sometimes the very miracle we're looking for only comes through the process because it's a test. Will we trust him at his word? Will we walk it out when we don't see it? Will we do the very thing that he's called us to do even though it looks crazy? I think about that man walking blindly through the city with mud on his eyes, trying to find the pool of Siloam, trying to be faithful, probably being mocked and ridiculed because they don't know who the he was that told them to go. Do you know who the he is that's speaking to you? Do you know who the he is that has called you? And it may be a test, but it's a test that's going to grow you. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to create a bigness, a, a perseverance in you. Whew. Will you believe when you can't see? Go show it without it. Hmm. Hmm. God will ask you to do some things that just seem crazy to other people, right? In Hebrews 11, when we talk about faith, what is faith? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So they had a hope that there was going to be restoration. They had a hope that there was going to be healing, but because it was Jesus who told them to go, they moved in an assurance that by the time they got there, it would happen. How many times do we say, God, I'll do it if you start it? God, I'll do it if you start it. We should just be saying, God, I'll do it if you set it. I'll do it if you said it, because if I start doing what you said, it will start. It doesn't mean that I have to see it start before I go. I'll be on the way if you just say it. Yeah. Hebrews 11, 6. Oh, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
There's a seeking that comes in this relationship. We've got to seek out God. God, he's, he's calling to us. He's calling us along. How many know God has always shown himself in the quiet still, in the still small voice? When God wanted to show himself to the prophet, he told him to stand out on the ledge and fire came and earthquakes came and God wasn't in those things. And then there was a still small voice. Oftentimes, we're looking for an earthquake to prove it's him when he's just spoken and all we need to do is move on that still small voice. God will ask us time and time to, again to believe what we cannot see. And many will call that foolishness. They'll call it blind faith. But when I think about foolishness, it brings me back to 1 Corinthians 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I'm not worried about what other people think. I'm worried about what God thinks about my response to what he said. And I understand that it's a test. And I'm okay with my God testing me because I understand that that's part of the situation. How am I, the creation, supposed to react to the creator and tell him no? How am I, as a, as a creation, supposed to say I don't like the rules that the creator has created? We work within his words. We work within his boundaries. The thing that we're looking to do is understand them more to be able to continue to persevere through. Right? Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that why you're here? Why are you here? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Jesus was offering these 10 an opportunity, an opportunity, a test to move in faith according to his word. Next time you come up against a wall, you come up against a problem in your life, I don't want you to just complain about the problem. I want you to look at the potential of an opportunity to move in faith with what Jesus said and on the way believing that thing is going to go. <laughs> believing that, that the Bible says that what's bound on earth will be bound in heaven. What does that mean? We have the ability to pray and see mountains thrown into the sea. We have the ability to believe God in his word, but we've got to be willing to start walking when we don't yet see it. If we pass the faith test, we will often be part in amazing things, including miracles. And as I close, number five, what will you do with your miracle? Where do you go when it finally shows? Who do you let know when it shows? It says in, in, in uh, chapter 17, verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Why does it point out that he was a Samaritan? Because actually, he was the one that was the least expected to turn back up. Yeah. Yeah. He was the one that was a foreigner. He came from a different place. Uh, he should just be happy that he received it and go on his way. The expectation was that he wouldn't come back, but he did come back. Sometimes we can find ourselves saying, <laughs> these other nine found themselves saying, well, I'm so thankful I'm healed, but I deserved it. After all, I wasn't a Samaritan. May we protect ourselves from having that kind of thought process yeah. towards the miracle. When we're standing in the miracle, how thankful are we? And what do we do with that gratitude? Hmm. If you see God as only a doctor, you'll appreciate the healing, but you won't go back to thank him. When's the last time you went back to thank your doctor after they prescribed you the right thing, after they gave you the right routine? You were just thankful that you had access to a good doctor, but you didn't think anything else of it. So the question is, is God a genie or is he God? Is God just your doctor who fixes your problems or is he your savior? Because how you respond says that. It doesn't matter what you say, it's what you do because love is a verb and it's an action. Are you getting this, church? So is he just your healer or is he just your healer or your savior? Is he the source of healing or the source of life? Even our gratitude will be tested. See, sometimes we think once we receive our miracle, it's over. No, no, no. Still a test. What are you gonna do with that miracle? I know a lot of people like like Hannah, who is barren and who couldn't have a child. They've prayed and prayed and prayed and they saw the miracle and they eventually have the child. But instead of bringing that child back to the Lord, the gift becomes greater than the giver. What? Their miracle actually takes them away from the giver. Oh, I'll, I'll raise the, the child in the house of the Lord and I'll, I'll continue to come and thank him until soccer season starts. 
I'll continue to bring them to the house of the Lord. I'll continue to train them until it's boat season and it's a nice sunny Sunday. Oh, I'll continue to raise them in the house of the Lord, but I got season tickets and it's football season. Always a test. You think it doesn't matter. You don't get to determine what matters. He's already determined. Are we grateful? Because we're even going to be tested in our gratitude. In Luke 17, Jesus asked, we're not all 10 cleansed. He wasn't asking because he wasn't sure. Where are the other nine? The response of where are the other nine is, where's their gratitude? Where's their coming back to thank God for the miracle? Here's the question. Will you be the one? As we close today, the last thought on your mind, will I be the one or just be the nine? Will I be the one? We're not all 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to praise God except this foreigner? See, being one of the 10 was special, but being the one brought blessing. Being one of the 10 brought healing, but being the one that returned brought a blessing. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Not just be healed, but rise and go. Yeah. There's a trajectory that has changed. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Let me lift you off the ground of the place where you were just weeping and thanking at my feet and let me send you on a different trajectory. There's a blessing that comes from being the one. Oh, well, I, I was one of the 10, but the other nine, we decided to go do this and I had too much peer pressure. I just stayed with them. Be the one who thinks for one. Yeah. Be the one who thinks only of one. And respond to your miracle properly because even your gratitude is a test. Did you receive this word? Yes. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as, as I pray? I, I tell you, we have an awesome opportunity every Sunday to see people come into relationship with Jesus. They don't just go to church anymore. They don't just claim Jesus. They've asked Jesus to come into their hearts to be their Lord and Savior, that God would forgive them, that the Holy Spirit would help them. And they move from death to life, as the scripture says. They move into God's family. And today, I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you realize, man, I, I have not, I've not been grateful. I haven't had that opportunity. Maybe you've pushed off the opportunity. Maybe you've, you've waited too long. And now you realize, like, no, I, I, I just need you to understand. No one's riding coattails into heaven. No one is going into heaven because of someone else's faith. It's a personal decision and we have an opportunity to respond properly. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, just as we did in the first experience, we're going to give people an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Because the Bible says if you believe in your hearts that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came to earth and He died for your sin, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips, you will be saved. Salvation is here and it's yours. To all those that receive Jesus, we don't deserve Him but we can't accept them. If that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're saying, Pastor Chad, include me in that prayer. I want to know where I stand with God. I'm going to help you with the words, but, but this is an opportunity for you to say yes to Jesus. So while no one else is looking around, it's a very personal moment. But if you're responding, whether you're here or on the other side of the screen, just quickly say, Pastor Chad, that's me. Just quickly slip up your hand wherever you are. Wherever you are, quickly in this moment. Yes, quickly. I see that hand. Wherever you are, that hand, quickly, quickly so good. And if that's you on the other side of the screen, I want to lead us all in this prayer. If you've prayed this prayer and you're already a Christian, come on, we can pray it together. Stand and affirm this other person's decision. Let's all say, Father, I thank you that you love me, that you sent your only son, Jesus, for me. Although I don't deserve him, today I accept him. I receive him. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Father, forgive me. And Holy Spirit, help me to live this life for you. I'm going to need a lot of help. But today, I give you my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give everyone a huge hand that made that decision. How exciting that is. The Bible says that all things have become new, that death has turned to life. You've become a new creation. So you may not feel different, but God sees you differently.
And as a church, we want to come alongside you and help you on this faith journey. So many people have scanned that QR code. So many people have decided to say, yes, I want to go through that class to help me understand faith and what a faith walk looks like. As a church, we don't just applaud for you. We want to help you along the way. And so we're about to show you a video so that you can know the next steps on how to move forward. But before I do, I just have two quick things. Firstly, we have Clean Sweep happening this Saturday. Say this Saturday. This Saturday, a whole bunch of people from this church, we're going to show up. We're going to throw on our Metro Church t-shirts that are available. We just give them out. And then we're going to have donuts and coffee, and we're going to have a little powwow here, get you all fueled up, and then we're just going to go love on our city. We're just going to go pick up trash, and we're going to go show love. Some people, you would go, that's not my thing. Can I tell you, Jesus picked up the trash that you were. Can we go pick up the trash for our city? He, I'm speaking to myself. I was, I was a wretch. Someone's like, I don't like the way he talks to us. <laughs> Just keeping it real, okay? Let's show up, register so that you don't miss your donut. There's some people in here that like donuts, and we will eat our share. So if you want your share of donuts and coffee, make sure you register. Lastly, we do have our mission to Ecuador. Uh, Cuenca, Ecuador, we're sending a mission team in September. And if you're interested in that, make sure you go talk to the people at the desk. Uh, you have an opportunity to be God's hands and feet this Saturday locally or later this year internationally. We're a church on the move. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week. Thank you again for being with us today. We hope you were encouraged by that awesome message. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, we want to say congratulations. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Now here's how we can help. First, scan the QR code on the screen letting us know that you made that decision. And we'll send you this free book called What on Earth Am I Here For? that talks about the purpose God has for your life. Our office will also send you information about our DNA class, which is a four-week series we offer here at Metro Church. If you missed the beginning of this service and would still like to participate in giving, you can do so through our app, website, or by scanning the QR code on the screen. If you're joining us for your first time, don't forget to pick up a blue gift bag on your way out. In this gift bag, you will find more details about Metro Church, along with a card that we would love for you to fill out and bring to our info desk. For every card that we receive, we will donate $10 to an orphanage that we help to support in Zimbabwe. In exchange for your information card, we will give you a voucher for you and your party to get a free beverage of your choice at our Metro Cafe. If you need prayer for absolutely anything, please scan the QR code on the screen. We would love to pray and believe with you. The altar will also be open for prayer after service. Thank you so much for being with us today. We love you, Metro Church, and we can't wait to see you again next week.